We'll start with an opening prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the honor and privilege of living in your beautiful creation. At this time, though, our creation is crumbling. We are crumbling from within. We have turned our eyes and gone blind from seeing you. And we ask that you would open the eyes of America and turn us back to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, last week we talked about how sin entices you, tempts you, and enters you through your vision. And everything you observe through your whole life molds and makes the person you are become. And there's a much more to vision, though, than just coming into my office and reading 2020 on the wall. That's seven. That's just the beginning. You've got to understand what you're seeing. And that's where perception comes in. And that gets complicated. Because we talk about two people that see the same thing, but observe something totally different. How's that possible? And so uh, that leads on to what we talk about pure vision, which is seen through spiritual eyes, or like through the eyes of Jesus, which leads to perfect perception, which eventually leads to knowing what the ultimate reality of life is, and that is God. He created all reality. So we ended with this photo. So if you weren't here last week, there's a rattlesnake there. And so it's a little tough to see. But the, the sidewinder rattlesnake buries itself in the sand. And right here's one eye, there's the other eye, and there's the nose. So if something crawls by, it's what it wants to eat. It jumps out and then bites it. Bites it. And then we ended with starting just the beginning of flash screens. So a flat screen is used nearly in everything in life today. At work, schools, conference calls, webinars, movies, games, FaceTime, reading books, remote TV, music, study aid, storage system, just to name a few. New studies show that flat screen use alters the brains of infants and young children. A study produced in JAMA Pediatrics showed that increased flat screen use in children results in lower expressive language, decreased literary skills, less ability to make objects rapid. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends avoiding flat screen use in children under 24 months of age. You see kids when they're a year old and they're sitting in front of this thing and watching them. You can't do that. There's a relationship between flat screen time in children body mass index, that is, they're stationary, they get overweight, they have less sleep per night, there's delays in cognition, slowing of language development, and poor social-emotional development. Flat screen use causes physical changes in brain structure. It causes significantly lower brain white matter uh, related to language and literacy skills. The NIH is doing an extensive research project on 12,000 kids for a 10 year period of time to try to come up with how much damage are we doing. Unfortunately, that's 10 years, well, not quite 10 years, eight or nine years away. So let's look at flat screens and see how we got here today. Flat screen, the first flat screen was a movie theater. The first commercially shown movie was about 45 seconds to a minute long, shown in 1895 in Paris, and it was called The Arrival of the Train. And it was a silent picture, no noise. And so there's on this big screen, there's a train coming at the people in the audience. At least there's a the theory that, or rumor that, it, there's panic in the theater because they had never seen anything like that before. Could you imagine, instead of seeing that train movie last for 45 seconds, they showed you the first movie of Star Wars. What would that do? They would have gone crazy. They would have, they would have left the, the theater immediately. The first film studio was built in 1897, and before 1927, motion pictures were produced without sound. A, a musician or a pianist would play sometimes during the movie. In 1927, Warner released the movie called The Jazz Singer, which has been redone several times, which had sound and portions of the movie. Movie producers continued to develop new and better ways of entertaining people. Editing became very important, so that way they could present the movie exactly how they wanted you to see it. In 1935, Technicolor was invented, and color pictures were born. Then drive-in movies became very popular, and then later, then 
movies became 3D. Now we have 3D movies. And Disney took that a step further. They have what they call 4D movies. That is your seat moves, their smell. They've added even more experience to your viewing. Early in the development of flat screen technology, people realized how much movies could influence people watching. Watching flat screens has the power to control even the most intelligent people. The human mind is incredibly susceptible to the effects of watching movies, videos, and other social media. The conscious and subconscious mind absorbs all the visual stimuli that your eyes are observing. All images, even some you may not want to remember, are still there. These images have become part of your paradigm, as we talked about last week. So even though you may not remember something, it's still there, and an instant pops up, and that brings it back to me. Hitler and Stalin knew that they could change people's beliefs with the movie screen. So Hitler and Stalin realized the power of movies and used the flat screen to their advantage. The first flat screen became a propaganda medium to control people. Unfortunately, technology has made the flat screen more powerful as technology keeps advancing. Hitler and Stalin produced and showed their propaganda movies throughout their countries. Ninety percent of Russians were illiterate back at that time. So they had no way to try to change their mind other than showing a movie. So they actually had movies on trains and they went around the country showing these movies at different train stations. And the movies, uh, was the movie industry was controlled by the Bolsheviks. So movies in Russia shrined the revolution's ideas calling on all workers to unite against any oppressors, celebrating Stalin as a great leader, and justifying any means necessary to protect the people. The Soviet film industry developed a uniform style known as socialist realism. The propaganda movies were shown from city to city, and Russia, Russian producers mastered the editing and sound precisely to make the audience sense panic and fear. Hitler and the Nazis were very rare with movies propaganda, uh, propaganda properties during the beginning of the rise in Germany. The National Socialist German Workers' Party planned the use of cinema for propaganda in 1930. The German propaganda films produced a subconscious association of Jews with rats. That's how they got away with doing what they were doing to the Jewish people because they had convinced them they were horrible people. Hitler wrote about the psychological effects of images in Mein Kampf when he wrote, one must remember that of itself, the multitude is mentally inert, <laughs> that it remains attached to its old habits, and that it is not naturally prone to read something which does not conform with their own pre-established beliefs, when such writing does not contain what the multitude hopes to find. The picture in all its forms, including film, has better prospects. In a much shorter time, at one stroke, I might say, people will understand a pictorial presentation of something which it would take them a long time and laborious effort of reading to understand. Joseph Goebbels was Hitler's propaganda minister and is famous for this statement. If you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will come to believe it. Another two of statements are, it's not propaganda's task to be intelligent, its task is to lead to success. And propaganda works best when those who are being manipulated are confident that they are acting of their own free will. <laughs> this effect was verified by a study at Temple University of Illinois University. The study is called Frequency and Conference of Referential Validity. The illusionary truth effect is a principle of psychology related to the fact that when something is said, and repeat it enough times, people will believe it is true even if untrue. This was backed up by another study in the Journal of Experimental Psychology called Knowledge Does Not Protect <coughs> Against Illusionary Truth. The illusionary truth effect can change a person's belief in the truth through frequent repetition of a false statement. You can make the truth what you want it to be if you know how to do it. Unfortunately, Big Tech National news media, radical leftist government, 
left-wing radical groups, liberal teachers know that this is true, and they will stop at nothing to rid America of its founding principles. God is being removed from society. Just like George Orwell said in his famous book, 1984, Great Brother will tell you that two plus two equals five, and you will eventually agree. The next flat screen to appear on the market was the television. Television brought movies, entertainment, news, and many other programs right into your living room. Companies, politicians, and anyone who wants to tell you something or influence you can bring them right into your home. The first color television was developed in 1953. 50% of homes had televisions by 1954. And by 1962, over 90% of homes had televisions. The next flat screen so the public created a monumental and everlasting change in how people live their lives. The personal computer was invented in 1977. By 1990, personal computers were small enough to be portable. In 1983, instead of naming a person, Time Magazine, Person of the Year, they named the computer the machine. <laughs> the internet would take connectivity and your involvement with the flat screen each day to a new level. On September 4th, 1998, Google appeared on the scene. Can you imagine living without Google today? <laughs> In 1994, Amazon was founded and changed how people shop. In 2004, Mark Zuckerberg developed Facebook and the beginning of social media media. As technology advanced, flat screen devices became smaller. Apple released the iPad in 2010. By May of 2017, they had sold 360 million iPads. Hitler and Stalin would celebrate being able to use connectivity with people today, and it would be simple to change people's minds. It would be easy to corrupt people today, which is, by the way, what has happened. Now you can have a flat screen on your wrist. Time Magazine named the smartphone the most influential gadget of all time. Android Chrysler will have no problem convincing people to follow him because he's got connect he'll be connected to everyone. The prevalence of use of flat screens is one of the primary reasons actually for writing this book. Flat screens and social media dominate social interaction, especially for our young people. Socially, Culturally, technology is changing the world. It's also changed how the world relates to God and removes God from society. Unhealthy flat screen addictions are flourishing because people do not see the consequences of their addiction to their flat screen, which is powerful beyond their imagination. Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, the new metaverse, and other smartphone apps distract you from the world around you, people are living in a fantasy world today. The culture is about, all about us, all about me. And I want instant gratification. Americans live hectic lives with flat screens pouring out information all day long. Your smartphone is continually going off 24 seven. All this stress of technology and flat screens is taking its toll on health and the well-being of people. Personal communication through a device is now the preferred way of communication. People do not want to speak person to person anymore. The average American looks at their smartphone 96 times a day. Mm -hmm. Americans are looking at their smartphones 50, 15 billion times a day. You tap, swipe, or click your smartphone 2,617 times a day. 75% Americans use their smartphone in the bathroom. So you don't need a magazine in there anymore. You just <laughs> the average American spends 5.4 hours on their smartphone. That's 67 days a year. Teens spend nearly 8 hours a day on their smartphone. And by stimulating their brain's limbic system and emotional center, they become addicted to the whims and fantasies of a smartphone. Smartphone use continues to increase every year. The increased use of flat screens begins to isolate. Bullying has skyrocketed because you can bully someone online and there's no consequence. You don't know, you don't know who they are or where they are. This type of stimulation alters how the mind thinks, 
functions and develops, which is especially true for young people. Americans are becoming obese because of diet, low exercise, and outdoor activity. People spend hours aimlessly going from one screen to the next, thinking that they're in control of their lives, but they are actually addicted to their flat screen. Mental disease is on the rise because of people's flat screen addiction. Flat screen use can lead to obesity, dry eyes, increased stress, anxiety, poor posture-related problems, sleeplessness, just to name a few. Technology will keep advancing and the addiction to flat screens will become more devastating. The resolution of flat screens is dramatically improved to make your viewing more vivid. There are now OLED screens which are extremely thin and actually can fold them, bend them, and you can eventually have every wall in your home with this thin screen and you have four walls of a TV. Hologram technology is advancing and virtual reality systems are advancing. We're going to be stimulating our minds to the extent that we'll never remove ourselves from that flat screen. And like in Star Trek, you'll have a holodeck in your home. Knowing how simple we are, it isn't going to be nature programs we're going to be watching. And I'm going to share some information or facts that you'll find pretty shocking. Porn sites receive more regular traffic Netflix, Amazon, and Twitter combined. 35% of all downloads are porn related. The world's <coughs> largest porn site received over 42 billion site visits in 2019. The teen porn category has topped the site searches for the last eight years. Girls aged 13 to 24 are the fastest growing demographic group watching porn. So your little girls are the fastest growing group watching the world. The world lures you into their dark web with all kinds of temptations, but technology, these temptations are becoming more enticing and addictive. First John chapter 2, verses 15 to 16 says, Do not love this world or the things it offers you. For when you love the world, do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and a pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away, along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. George Martin is quoted as saying as are Christians using technology to transform the world, or is technology transforming Christians in unhealthy ways? The culture and society of America are fading away. The power of visual communication is staggering. The secular world constantly wants and works to change your perception and beliefs. You saw the coverage of the riots in 2020, and they have that CNN with a reporter saying, we're at this peaceful demonstration. In the background, buildings are being burned. They're throwing firebombs. They're beating up people. But it was peaceful. They're, they can get away with it. They're that brazen to know that they tell you that long enough that it was peaceful. You'll forget about the stuff in your life. You may be unaware, but everything you know online is monitored. Google spiders and the government know every page that you have looked at and how long you were on that page. <laughs> every word is analyzed for its effect on you. Every image or video is choreographed so that you see what they want you to see. The media selects, takes things out of context, shapes and molds its presentation, and is designed for one purpose. Press their liberal agenda, destroy the family, and remove God from society. They, are used, they use many proven ways to influence you, such as agenda setting, framing, cultivation theory, decoy effect, scarcity theory, loss aversion, and anchoring theory. These are some of the techniques they use to change your influence. They know that camera angles, lighting and color alter your perception, just like we look at all those images. They have studied and continue to study human reactions to their techniques. Colossians 2, verse 8, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that comes from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world, 
rather than from Christ. You might be thinking, I'm too smart to follow that. Like, I can't fall for those kind of things. Intelligent people are, are not acceptable, susceptible to having their ways changed them, right? Sorry to say, but you're wrong. Research has shown that the most educated with the highest mathematical skills have the strongest tendencies and are confident about their beliefs are more likely to resist true information about an issue from their beliefs. You cannot change their beliefs with new facts, even other true facts. They have been indoctrinated into their beliefs through America's liberal education system, and they believe in their false narrative. People keep repeating false statements to make sure that uh, that's because they can't analyze new information. The closed minds or parents have embedded their beliefs deeper and deeper into their brains. In most cases, you can make the mistake of thinking you can change their mind if you show them a true fact. But they don't want to accept that true fact because in today's time, especially young people, don't believe in facts. It's their feelings about a fact that's more important than the fact. The secular activist liberal world views any and all methods to persuade you to believe in their way of life. The propaganda they use is deliberate, systematic process to shape perceptions, beliefs, manipulate cognitions, and change behaviors to achieve their goal of changing culture and society. They use false statements, partial truths, statements out of context, selective information, and transmit only those ideas needed to accomplish their goals. They promote their agenda no matter the true facts. They're intolerant of being shown facts contrary to their beliefs. They become hostile and belligerent when you show them facts. Our young people are being programmed and brainwashed to believe that facts and truth are unnecessary. It's your feelings or your opinions that matter. You can be you can be a different gender each day. You photograph the two true facts. It's cool not to be shackled down by truth and facts. A great book by Abdul Murray titled Saving Truth with the subtitle Finding Meaning and Clarity in a Post-Truth World. Young people have difficulty in believing in the absolute truth of gospel of the gospel. Religion has too many rules and restricts their lifestyle. Young people have different views on gender, identity, gay lifestyles, sex, and marriage. Jim Morrison of the man the doors remember him. Whoever controls the medium controls the mind. So even the got podcast star do that whoever controls the media controls the mind. In the 17th century, even back then, it was still Blaise Pascal made this thing. Truth is so obscure at these times, and falsehood so established that unless we love the truth, we do not know it. So even in the 17th century, they realized it. But now it's much more advanced. Another term for technology and flat screen influence on changing culture and society is known as technology determinism. Technology determinism is how technology determines society's structure and values. As technology advances and its influences are incorporated into society, it will immediately offer activities and behaviors. These changes have a ripple effect or a long-term effect that defines the culture and society today. These effects also alter religious beliefs and practices. Persuasive technology was developed by Stanford researcher B.J. Fogg. He referred to this field of study called captology. It's the system of using technology to change how you live your life and shape what you believe. These three criteria must be fulfilled for you to do what they want you to do. First, you must want to do it. Second, you must be able to do it. And third, you must be promoted to do it. An example of captology is Netflix. So you're watching one of their series and as it gets close to the end of the series, the movie, they leave you in suspense what's going to happen next. And the next one starts immediately. Mm -hmm. And the next thing you know, five sessions later, you know, okay, this is number five. They, you have to physically do something to stop it. They make it easier to do what they want you to do. Social media, though, does have many positive benefits, but it also has robbed people of individual activity. It's taken away from many people the ability to find trust, comfort with one another. We have replaced personal interaction with hollow, virtual relationships with others. The younger generations have limited social and personal 
interactions with their peers. It's all by text. A journal by Jacob Amity titled The Impact of Social Media on Society says, each step forward in social media has made it easier, just a little, to avoid the emotional work of being present, to convey information rather than humanity. He also says social media robs us of self-control and the ability to think independently. Instead, makes us gullible to join any group that posts persuasive messages that tickle our ears and abuse our senses without the evaluation of consequences. Social media's short-term effects are priming, arousal, and mimicry from the dopamine release in the brain. Priming processes occur in the brain by being excited about participating in social media. There is increased arousal, arousal secondary to the stimulation from social media. Mimicry occurs when we mimic or copy what you see. The long-term effects are observational learning of thought and behaviors, activation, and desensitization of emotional centers in your limbic system. So you keep looking at the same thing that would initially be very objectionable to you, but you get desensitized, which is what you're watching as routine. The suicide rate in young people aged 10 to 24 has increased by 60% from 2007 to 2018. There is some good news. You can learn to see by which we talked about earlier. Perceive by Understand the ultimate reality of life. And that's the reason for the book, first title, Pure Vision, Perfect Perception, Ultimate Reality. Pure vision means trying to see the world with spiritual eyes and through the eyes of Jesus. Perfect perception means you perceive the world as it truly exists. Just because you have 20-20 vision doesn't mean you see or perceive things correctly. You can learn to improve your perception by training. You actually can train yourself to do that. So all those pictures we saw last week, some people can learn to see those things pretty quickly. Why do people make mistakes in their perception? In most cases, it's not because they have loss of vision. Many people go through life and do not pay much attention to their surroundings. They're just self-absorbed in their lives and they just don't really pay attention to what's going on. You fill in those gaps when you're not paying attention with your paradigm. So your paradigm may fill in something that was wrong because that just makes sense of the gap. Another way to describe visual perception is called visual intelligence. Visual intelligence is the capacity for learning, reasoning, understanding, and similar forms of mental activity, aptitude in grasping truths, facts, and meanings. Visual intelligence refers to a person's ability to perceive and analyze and understand visual information in the world around them. Other terms you might think are discernment, savvy, skill, knowledge, comprehension, cleverness. You need to be aware of logic, emotion, and attitude suggested in a visual message, and the ability to produce meaningful images when you communicate with others. You need to recognize attitudes, beliefs, and true meanings embedded within and between images on a flat screen, and develop visual intelligence. Visual intelligence means observing differently, seeing what's behind the images, looking more abstractly, and looking into the images Visual intelligence is a system and looking at the world around us in a critical analyzing awareness that can be trained and developed to lead you towards perfect perception. You need to become a Sherlock Holmes when evaluating something. You need to think about the five W's, who, what, where, why, and when. So this is a famous picture of Whistler's mother. So now, actually, uh, I've read a couple of books on this. The evaluating art is an excellent way of training your perception. The FBI now uses art as a way of training their agents to perceive and, and understand things better. They're also using this in medical school. So they're actually now art evaluation to help medical students become better clinicians of what they're looking at. And when you're doing something like this, you need to follow a logical observation of that. So you need to take a look at the whole picture overall. 
and then, depending on how many things are in it, this is a pretty plain picture, but depending on how many things are in it, then you need to divide that picture up into sections and look at each section to find out the more fine detail. So if you're looking at this famous case of, of uh, Whistler's mother, uh, what do you think about this painting? What would be your observations of this famous painting? Well, first, there's a compelling stillness to it. It has a minimalist portrayal and geometric austerity. She is rigid and erect, wearing a long black clothes that you might wear in a funeral. Her appearance is icy and is, ex and is accentuated by black and gray colors. She and the dark colored chair face to the left and away from the artist. She is wearing a white lace cap and a bonnet that breaks past her shoulders that could be tied. The type of head covering would be common in the era of the late 1800s, 1880s. Her dress sleeves have lice cuffs. Her hands are folded in her lap, clutching a white handkerchief. There's a rectangular painting on the wall with a scene of a building in front of a field. At the right top corner is a black edge of what appears to be another picture frame. Her head is not quite an equal distance between the frames. Her head is slightly tilted down, and she seems to be gazing slightly up. Staring at something maybe higher than I level. On the left side of the painting is a black vertical hanging drapery that is a white, intricate, subtle pattern in the drapery. The black wall has a matte gray appearance with a dark, large base, probably the having trouble with seeing because of the lights. The wood flooring actually runs vertical. Her shoes would be considered basic or plain and did not match the status of her dress. So there's all kinds of objects where you can take your time, observations you can make about a painting that can help train your observation skills. Another factor involving the blinding of America is that the average person is putting five times the amount of information in their brains compared just a few decades ago. So I said before, the average person that's attached to their flat screen 10 to 12 hours a day. The lifestyle in America is fast paced with 24 access to nearly anything you want. Americans are constantly stimulating the emotional center of their brain, which is the center for your anger, lust, flight, and uh, fight response. People are stressing their nervous systems to the max. Look at all the mental diseases in America, and alcohol abuse and drug abuse. There's a book by Richard Swenson, M.D., titled Margin, How to Create the Emotional, Physical, Financial, and Time Reserves You Need. Margin is the space that once ex existed between ourselves and our limits. When you reach past your limits of resource, tolerances, or abilities, you're out of margin. Once you're out of margin, bad things begin to happen. America's outside of those margins. Look at road rage in America today. How easy it is to get people to loot and fight and burn. A significant amount of those rioters were young women from wealthy families. How were they, why were they doing that? Culture, society, and the family of Christianity need to be intertwined to prosper and survive the attacks of Satan in the second world. Once God is removed from society, it will begin to crumble and disintegrate into chaos. Ulti what is ultimate reality that I've talked about? For the past 2,500 years, famous philosophers have written, debated the various aspects of truth and reality. Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, Cicero, Hume, Scardius, Kuhn, many all these other philosophers, they have proposed their beliefs about humankind's origin, meaning, reality, and destiny. They tried to use science, logic, and their own opinions. While they did explain some things well, the final decrees of many of them led to paradoxes and confusion. Reality is the quality or state of being actual or true. From the very beginning of humankind, when the first flickers of self-awareness and consciousness were uh, present, we have searched, contemplated our origin, meaning of life, destiny, and reality. What is the nature of our universe? What is our place in the universe? Why are we here? What is the reality of our existence? Most philosophers and scientists 
about reality fell to the end at the source of creation and reality God. All reality and truth must be based on God. His laws of physics and science and information found in the Bible must be the foundation on which we base everything. I think that true reality should actually be called ultimate reality. Ultimate reality transcends the non-physical and physical dimensions of the universe. Ultimate reality is the most all-inclusive reality, the most authentic reality. It is the origin of all things in the world. Simply stated, the creator of all things in the universe has created reality. God is the source of ultimate reality. The eye is a window to your soul and spirit. Flat screens are powerful tools. The key is controlling what you're watching versus flat screens controlling. The key to the key is controlling what you are watching versus flat screens controlling. You. There's a ferocious battle to control your mind and the forces seen and unseen. The secular world is ruthlessly pressing its agenda 24/7. It is relentless and intense. If you're older enough, you'll remember there were three TV stations, and at 11 o'clock, they played the national anthem and they turned to snow. <laughs> Black screens were dormant until the next morning. What a difference that is to them. Visual temptations are everywhere. You and I need to be careful, but it's vital for us to protect our children and grandchildren. You've got to get control of their flat screens. The Blinding of America is one of the most important books you will read. All parents, all grandparents need to read the book. Unfortunately, it was written by an unknown author with limited writing skills. <laughs> America is in trouble. Today's kids are raised by flat screens in our radical education system. The images they are viewing are altering their minds. Many people believe that woke teaching was just at university. We now know it was in Greece. My daughter teaches school in Lee County, and since COVID and all the Zoom and all the stuff that happened at home and they're not watching the flash screens anymore. Today, they get referrals to the principal 40 to 50 or more a day. They're out of control. This book is warning about the damage flat screens are doing and that there's something you can do about it. If we don't do something, our children and grandchildren will be lost. This book will guide you and recommend to you about helping your children, grandchildren to recognize the propaganda on their screens. The schools need to change, and you must help, like I said, control their flat screen use. The clearing of America's vision needs to start now. So the books are available in the bookstore. I donate all the books to church sales so they get the total profit from the book. And if you so if you were here last week, you'll remember. But I started out with this cigar and telling you, well, this is pretty dangerous. You shouldn't really do this. And then, you know, the only thing is, if you're a Christian, the worst thing this thing can do to you is it gets you to God's work. You still get to heaven. You still get to leave of Jesus in heaven. That's the worst this thing can do. That flat screen is dangerous. It can rob you of your soul. You will be blind and lost and never be able to find your way to heaven. Do not let that flat screen in a secular world with this propaganda and nonsense, indoctrinate with you or your family. Mm -hmm. Today's young people are connected to their phones 24 7. The garbage they are viewing is horrible. America needs, you need, I need, but more importantly, your children and grandchildren need pure vision, perfect perception, which will open their eyes to see the ultimate true reality of life, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Jim, I, I would like to put someone on the spot here who has been in our home many times and from the very beginning, uh, her and her children and her husband's children, I think we all know the Sue Kim family, um, very aware of flat screens. And Christina, I'd like you just to say, 
What do you do to control those five kids? Because we know they like they like flat screens. Yes. But what do you do to to guide them to uh, away from this? Okay. Well, um, thanks for putting me on the spot. You're welcome. <laughs> um, I, at our house, we have a lot of rules that um, we we tell them that these rules are there to protect them and to help them. Um, and so one of those rules with the flat screens is you can't use it alone. You have to be with other people. And we use, um, we do a, a designated flat screen time. Um, on Saturday mornings we have screen time. But it's not, we don't want it ever to be something that you use this screen because you're bored. It's because it's a specific time, they know, they know what um, PBS Kids app or whatever app that they're allowed to use, and that's it. And then we try to, I think the other part is to make it so that there's so many other things that are more appealing than the flat screen that it kind of ruins their taste for it. I mean, that's what we, we try, not perfect. They still love having that screen time. But they know that, ooh, when we go to the library, there's so many cool books that they can look at. When we go to such and such a place, there's exploring to be done. But in China now, they know the problem with flat screen. So children in China can only get on a flat screen on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night from 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock. That's it. We're limited. Otherwise, we're going to leave. Okay, well, thanks for showing up for coming. Hope you guys uh, learned something and you got to stay with kids.